Hello and welcome to a very special interview with former Home and Finance Minister P. Chidambaram for The Wire.in. Over the course of the next 45 minutes, I shall talk to him about topical and important social, political and economic issues. Mr. Chidambaram, let's first start with a critical issue raised by the Padmavati controversy. And I want to put that to you, not just as a former Home Minister, but as one of the country's leading lawyers. In a democracy, does freedom of expression and freedom of speech permit a director to interpret historical events or historical personages as he deems fit? Or is he required to do it along the lines the majority accepts as reliable and preferable? As a matter of law, freedom of speech and expression is nearly absolute. It's uh, subject to very, very narrow limitation of national security. Unless accompanied by violence, I think that freedom is almost absolute. And it's certainly not subject to censors, self-appointed censors. And what I think the opponents of the movie are trying to do without seeing the movie is to censor it when that role is a role given to the Central Board of Film Certification. Apart from that, I have not seen the movie. I don't know whether it's, a, it's fiction or non-fiction or fictionalized history. I think each of these genres has a certain liberty. And unless one sees the movie, I think it would be completely unacceptable to censor it without even seeing the movie. But as a former Home Minister and as a leading lawyer, you believe a director has the right to interpret historical events and historical characters as he wants creatively and imaginatively. He doesn't have to follow either tradition or the thinking of the majority. Obviously, he does not have to follow the thinking of the majority. This is not a collective uh, uh, literary work of the majority. We've had movies on Lincoln. We have had movies on JFK. Uh, We've had movies on many other historical Christ as personality well. and Christ as well. And I think a creative person has a certain liberty. As long as he doesn't do something which is impinging on national security or does not promote violence. So three quick questions about Padmavati. When politicians or civil society groups demand the film be banned or extensively changed before it's released and they haven't even seen the film and they don't have an accurate idea of its content, is that a legitimate demand or is it just far-fetched, exaggerated and ludicrous? I think uh, you've answered it yourself in your question. I think the first group that should see it is the Central Board of Film Certification. A second question. Practically every credible historian of medieval India has gone on record to say, Harbans Mukhya, the doin of them in particular, that Padmavati is not a historical character. No lady of this sort ever lived. The story of Padmavati, in fact, is based on a Sufi poem by the Muslim poet Jayasi, written in the 16th century, some two and a quarter centuries after this supposed event or story is supposed to have happened. And yet Sanjay Leela Bhansali, is being accused of historical distortion. Padmavati is clearly either a literary character or a cultural myth. She's not a historical reality. So how can her story be considered historically distorted? I don't know. I mean, I don't know the history of uh, uh, the characters, uh, nor have I seen the movie. I'm not a student of history of that part of India. Now, today we've reached a situation where the Chief Minister of Madhya Pradesh has gone on record to refer to Padmavati as Rashtra Mata, mm -hmm. mother of the nation. Four BJP states, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan and today Gujarat, have decided they won't let the film be screened. And it hasn't even got a CBFC certificate as yet. How do you as a former Home Minister respond to politicians speaking and behaving like this? Well, I think it will find its way to the courts <laughs> after the CBFC certification and uh, I'm sure one or the other would have to go to court and I think the court will sort it out. But is it fitting for chief ministers to pronounce on a film they haven't seen 
and to say they will ban it before it's even been given a certificate? I mean, is that a proper role for a chief minister? It's not appropriate for anyone to censor the film in his own mind and ask for a ban unless he sees the movie. And in any event, that judgment has to be made by the CBFC. It can't be made by a chief minister of a state or for that matter, any other person. The sad part is it's not just BJP chief ministers who've been saying these things. Your colleague Amarinder Singh, the chief minister of Punjab, and a reputed military historian in his own right, has gone on record to say of the directors and the actors of the film, they are distorting history. No one would accept distortion of history. But he hasn't seen the film. And Padmavati, as Harbans Mukhe has said, and he's the doyen of medieval historians, isn't history. She's a creation of poetry. Well, I don't know. I answered that question earlier. I don't know the facts of the movie, nor do I know the history that you refer to. But uh, if Captain Amrinder Singh has said you should not distort history, if the historical fact is established, obviously you should not distort history. You can take a few liberties, but you can't distort history. But I don't even know the history of the story you're talking about. In fact, the truth is Padmavati is not history. Well, I don't know. She's I a said. literary <laughs> creation. I don't know. Uh, but hasn't Captain Amrinder Singh embarrassed you in the party by speaking out? He's aligning with the BJP, well, who's taken a bizarre I, position. I, I don't think he's aligning with the BJP. I think his statement is qualified. I'm not uh, defending it or I'm not criticizing it. I think he says you cannot distort history. I mean, as a normative statement, that is unexceptionable. Except he's saying they are distorting history, meaning the <laughs> yes. director and actors. Well, I don't know if he's seen the movie. I don't know. He clearly can't have. I don't know. If the movie has been privately screened, I believe, for people. I wish they had screened it for you and me. Let me put it like this. Other than a passing comment made by Shashi Tharoor at the Mumbai Lestri Festival, not a single leading congressman has defended the right of a director to make a movie about Padmavati as he wants. No, on this critical making, issue, shouldn't the Congress have spoken out? No, not necessary. A party need not speak on everything, number one. Number two, unless somebody sees the movie, I don't think you can comment one way or the other. And if, uh, as you believe and I believe, no one has seen the movie, then why comment on it? It's not the movie we're commenting on. We're commenting on the right in a democracy of a director no, no, I think to the portray Party. a historical character as he deems fit. Again, you're making assumptions, and I've answered this half a dozen times. I don't know the historical facts that you're referring to, nor do I know the facts of that movie. It's not the movie. I'm making a broader point. Yours is a party that is proud of its liberal traditions. You claim to be more liberal than the BJP. Of course we are. And we're talking of a fundamental issue in a democracy, freedom of speech and freedom of expression. No, and no, I think somebody from the party has made a statement that people cannot ask for banning movies without seeing the movie. And yet your chief minister in Punjab has actually accused the people of distorting when he hasn't no, no, even no. seen the movie. I've film. answered the question. You are repeating yourself. Can I put it like this? Many in India would be reassured if Sonia or Rahul Gandhi had spoken out in defense of the freedom of a director, not the movie, but the principle, but they're silent, and when they're silent, people say they're worried they're going to lose the support of Rajputs no, and votes. I don't think you should link everything to voting and votes. The party spokesman has said no one should ask for a ban of the movie without the CBFC certifying it. And I think that's an adequate position for the party to take at this stage when the movie is not public yet. I take the point you're making. Yet I remember in 2008 when Mahpur Fida Hussain had to leave India, he publicly told the New York Times he'd done so because he wasn't confident the Congress government of the day, which was your government, would protect him. In protect what? Him. Who? Mahpur Fida Hussain. He left the country I and told the New York I Times don't know he'd story. done so because he wasn't confident Congress would protect him. In 2012, when Salman Rushdie was invited by the Jaipur Literary Festival, the Rajasthan government, which was your government, advised him A, not to come, and then they B, advised him not even to do a video link. And people say, on these critical issues of freedom of expression, Congress may claim to be more liberal, but at the end of the day, they're as pusillanimous as the BJP. No, There's no real com difference. Completely wrong. I don't know the first case you're talking about. Uh, I know the Salman Rushdie case. He was 
I think he later came. He didn't come. Or he came on another occasion. He came much earlier, but for the yeah. Jaipur Literary Festival, he was advised by the Rajasthan government, A, against coming, and B, even doing a video link. In the end, he had to do an interview with NDTV outside the Jaipur Literary Festival to talk about the fact that he'd been denied even permission to do a video link. No, I don't know who advised him or uh, who took that decision from him. Our position is that creative writers authors, filmmakers have a certain freedom which is nearly absolute. As I said, a very narrow qualification is permissible under law. Uh, and for example, in the Perumal Murugan controversy, I took a public position that he was entitled to write what he believed was right and his book should be published. And I even said that when he announced that he will no longer write. I said that is unfortunate. He should write again. Except that that was the position you took as an individual, and you're well, a leading <laughs> member of the party, but your party <laughs> was silent. Well, this is this is uh, this is uh, this is quibbling. If uh, I take a position, obviously it's an individual's position, and you won't then uh, uh, attribute it to the party, which is okay. But when Captain Amrinder Singh takes a position, that becomes a party's position. I think we should close the subject. One last question. We are, we are, we are we just going that, over the same one, thing one again One last and again. question. On an issue which has become a litmus test of India's democracy today, it's attracting enormous attention, not just at home, but abroad. Uh, Shouldn't no. Rahul and Sonia Gandhi have voiced defense of the principle? I don't think. Not the film, but I the principle. I don't think it's necessary for, on every subject for the Congress President or the Congress Vice President to speak. Uh, has the Prime Minister spoken? If anything, the person in authority must speak, not persons in the opposition. The point is, the Congress Party has clearly said that calling for a ban on the film, even before the CBFC has looked at it, is wrong. And that, I think, is adequate given the circumstances. All right, let's come to a second subject. It's now absolutely clear that by early December, either the 4th or the 10th, depending upon when it happens, Rahul Gandhi will be mm -hmm. the new Congress president. And he takes over at a time when your party's political fortunes are at their lowest ebb. You have 44 seats in the Lok Sabha. You command just six states at the moment, one of which is a union territory, one of which you could lose if you lose him actually in a couple of weeks' time. What qualities does Rahul Gandhi have to reverse the tide? You see, the party accepts him as a leader. As long as the vast majority of Congress men and Congress women accept him as a leader, you as a private citizen can criticize the choice, but you have really no role in making that choice. The party makes that choice. Why does the Samajwadi party elect Akhilesh as a president? Why does the uh, Bahujan Samaj Party elect uh, Mayavati as the president. These are matters for within the party. Now, if the party elects him, the party believes that he can revive the party, he can lead the party to I wasn't victories. criticizing the decision. Ah, okay. I was asking what qualities yeah. does he have I think, that well, lead you to believe well, he I can revive the party? I think it's important that he represents another generation of Congress leaders. Among them, there are Jyoti Raditya Sindhya, Sachin Pilot, there are many others. He represents another generation. And I've said this for the last, what, six, seven years. It is a time to hand over the torch to the next generation, which is what we are doing. How that generation fulfills its responsibilities, we'll have to wait and see. But I think he is matured. Uh, he reads quite extensively. He assembles groups of people and hears them out, asks them questions. Very recently he had 50 or 60 field level research persons from the CMIE, the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy. He meets with uh, groups of investors. Uh, meets with other um, thinkers, writers, and I think every day he's learning and gaining more. And we believe that 
he has the qualities to lead the party. I accept that Rahul Gandhi, after his trip from America, is a reinvigorated personality. <laughs> well, I think, I I think accept, you, guys have, you guys have rediscovered him. And I accept that he represents a younger generation yes. and the generation change is due. But he doesn't at the moment have a strong winning political message for the Indian people. That's no, a nor does he have strong state-wise leaders or a strong state-wise organization to match the BGP. Uh, Would well, you accept What you're saying those, is nothing new. But are those two gaps that need to be what urgently filled? What you're saying is nothing new. We have, I've always said that the Congress Party's weakness is the organizational weakness. We must look at blocks. Those are the key units of a party. At the block level, in the municipal towns, it's the ward level. There are gaps there. We are focusing on those gaps. We are filling those gaps. We are building those blocks. The organization must become strong. Without a strong organization, no leader can deliver in an election. I hope that the organization will become strong. He will pay more attention to the organization. He's got 18 months in which to do it before the next elections. Well, 18 months in a sense is short, in a sense is long enough. If the people warm up to a party, the party gets energized. If the party gets energized, more people warm up to yes, the party. But the words that were critical were if the people warm up. They He's are. had three and a half years oh, wait, and he hasn't built the blocks. If, if you now are, you're depending you, on people warming up. If you don't see the change that is taking place or has taken place over the last two or three months, I think you're out of touch. Let me put you two concerns people have. One, what happens to the old guard when Rahul Gandhi and the new generation takes over? I'm talking of people like Ahmed Patel, well, Janardhan Devedi, <laughs> you, Digvijay Singh, I'm Kar very happy. Kamal Nath. What I'm happens to all of you? Nothing happens to us. We remain congressmen. I'm very happy. I will continue to write. I will continue to speak. I will continue to advise. But will you I'm and will Janardhan Devedi and Amal, uh, Ahmed Patel have critical roles to play? I don't know. It's that's for the Congress president to decide, but I'm sure. So there are question marks hanging no, in the air. No, there's no question mark. Question mark is in your mind. He will use the talents of everyone. As he sees fit. Obviously. Or if he doesn't see fit, he won't. <laughs> well, what kind of a question is this? Uh, have you had a baby? Yes. Is it a boy or a girl? It has to be a boy or a girl. Nah. Either he sees fit or he doesn't see fit. What kind of uh, question Except is that? Except for the fact that there could be a lot of talent that he may not use and that could be the disadvantage of the party. These are judgments that are made. If you are the president of a party, we have to defer to your judgment. Another critical concern people have is how will Rahul Gandhi, given the age difference, relate with allies like Sharad Pawar or Lalu Yadav or Deva Gowda or even Mamta Banerjee and M.K. Stalin? Ra Rajiv Gandhi was 40 when he related to political party leaders much older than he. But he didn't need allies as critically as Rahul does today. He, he, didn't, need, he didn't need allies for the election that he contested in 1984. But I think in 1989, in one or two states, he did uh, forge alliances, for example, in Tamil Nadu. Therefore, and you're saying what Rajiv did, Rahul no, can no, do as this well. No, nothing to do with age. Nothing to do with age differences. It's not as though leaders of allied parties must belong to the same age group. You can have a younger but leader. But you're confident you can older he can leader. get on with people who are much older and may look upon him as an inexperienced young person? <laughs> well, he's not really an inexperienced young person. Please understand, he's 46, 47 years old. At 47, people become... Uh, people have become president of the United States. So people will learn to relate to the uh, fact on the ground. The fact is that he, if he becomes Congress president... Why do you say he if? A, he will. Well, he has to file his nomination first. <laughs> but what you're saying is when they see him as Congress president, yes. their attitude will change because the role that he will be in will change the way they don't, perceive don't him. Don't people deal with M.K. Stalin now, now that Mr. Karunanadi is no longer active? Did not people deal with Jailalita after MGR passed away? I think these uh, did not people deal with Mamta Banerjee. The position changes the person and how you perceive him. Let me put this to you. When he takes over, Sonia Gandhi will have stepped aside. She's been the longest serving Congress president. You seem Congress to be president. privy to information which I am oh, not privy have, she'll to. She'll have stepped aside as Congress president. Well, I don't know. Let's wait for the nomination. 
Let's wait for the nomination to be made first. But Mr. Chidambaram, with a smile on your face, you're suggesting that if she doesn't step aside as Congress president and Rahul does become president, there could be dual presidents <laughs> together. <laughs> These are, you are, you are, this is flight of fancy. All I'm saying is, we have announced the schedule for the election. It is widely expected that Mr. Rahul Gandhi will file his nomination on the first. If you ask me this question on the second, I can answer. But, Whoever, but your somebody language is raising doubts in people's uh, minds. No doubt. Because doubt is in your when mind. you say widely <laughs> expected, it suggests it's possible he may not file no, his the nomination. The doubt is in your mind. There's, nobody, uh, there's uh, no doubt in my and mind. And when you said Sonia won't step aside, you're suggesting there could be a <laughs> dual presidency. You are, you are quibbling. And this is the only word I can no, use. No, no, all I was going to do. You are quibbling 100%. No, I wasn't once intending he to files his nomina Once he files his nomination, we will know that he is the candidate for president. I was going to ask. And I expect him to be elected unopposed. I was going when to he's ask. Elected, wait a minute. When he's elected, when he's elected as Congress president, obviously the incumbent Congress president will step aside. The question I was going to ask and unfortunately you didn't let me finish, is what will Mrs. Gandhi's role be thereafter? Will she disappear into the background? Of course she won't. So Why would she disappear into the background? So what role will she play? When one Congress president takes over, the previous Congress president doesn't disappear. In the history of the Congress, there have been many, many ex-Congress presidents who continue to play an active role. The obvious example, recent example, was Shankar Dayal Sharma. That was, was a president. long time ago. <laughs> Since Indira Gandhi in 1980, you haven't had ex-Congress presidents after her. Indira Wrong. Gandhi died as sitting president. Rajiv Gandhi died as sitting president. Sonia Wrong. Gandhi took over. There was Narsimha <laughs> Rao who disappeared into the background thereafter. Sitaram Kesri died pretty soon. Please understand. There was Shankar Dayal Sharma, ex-Congress president. He was very much alive and I very much, much active. Earlier vintage. No, no, no. The, we are talking about after Indira Gandhi passed away. Okay. Shankar Dayal Sharma, an ex-Congress president, was there, very much there. Narsimha was there. He ceased to be a Congress president. Sita Ram Kesri was there. He ceased to be Congress president. Therefore, we've had ex-Congress presidents continue to play a role. And I have no doubt in my mind Mrs. Gandhi will continue to play an active role after she makes way for a new Congress president. Now, Rahul Gandhi's first test, almost days after he takes over as Congress president, will be Gujarat. The BJP has ruled Gujarat for 22 years. Do you share the belief that's emerging in the press that the ground could be shifting in Congress's favor? Or are you hesitant to say so? Well, I have made brief visits to Gujarat. I have noticed that the party has been energized. I noticed that there is a wind of change blowing. But what will be the result of election, I cannot say. I'll tell you why. The campaign hasn't started yet effectively because nominations were over only yesterday. The campaign will start for phase one after the last date of withdrawal. The campaign has the capacity to change the fortunes of parties. But at the moment, I can say with confidence, the party is energized on the ground. I was in Rajkot. On the ground, there are people who are confident that they can win particular seats. For example, the Rajkot West seat where the Chief Minister Vijay Rupani is contesting. Our sitting MLA in Rajkot East, who is confident of retaining his seat, has deliberately shifted to Rajkot West. And you think he can defeat Rupani? He says, I will defeat Rupani. And you believe that? Well, I can only report what he said. How do I believe or disbelieve him? Let me put it but like this. He could have easily retained Rajkot East. So this is a sign MLA. of confidence. It's a sign of confidence which pleasantly surprised me. Let me put it like this. Many people say one of the reasons why Congress is confident this time around is because you hope to have the support of Hardik Patel and the Patidar Association. And today, Tuesday, Hardik Patel held a press conference where he said two very important things. First of all, he said that Congress has assured him that they will carry out reservations under Article 46, protected by Article 31. My question is a simple one. You're a lawyer. How confident are you 
that such reservations which will exceed the 49% ceiling of the Supreme Court won't be struck down as unconstitutional. In other words, are you, as Arun Jaitley said this afternoon, fooling Hardik Patel and fooling the Patidars by this promise? I thought fooling the people with promises is the hallmark of the BJP. They fool the people when they said that they will put 15 lakhs in everyone's account. They fool the people when they said they will create two crore job opportunities a year. So let's leave out hard words. Those were his words. I know. That's why I said let's leave out hard words. They break no bones anyway. The point is Mr. Kapil Sibyl has studied the matter and he's come up with a possible solution to the 50% cap imposed by the Supreme Court. I haven't uh, studied it in great depth, but he shared it with me. I think it's feasible. And for a lawyer, when you attempt a new argument, you have to believe that that argument can succeed. Well, you have to believe it to convince Hardik, but the problem is that the most important thing at this point is getting Hardik on board. Has Hardik, as Arun Jaitley says, been misled by your confidence? No, I don't think so. I think they've spent hours discussing it, and I'm sure they must have looked at the pros and cons, and they must have been convinced that this is doable. Let me quote section 46. It says, the state Article shall 46. Forgive me. The state shall promote with special care the educational and economic interests of the weaker sections of the people. And then it goes on to say, in particular, scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Your hope is that the Supreme Court will say extending reservations beyond the 49% ceiling is justified and legitimate because it promotes with special care educational and economic interests of weaker sections. That's the only hope you have. <laughs> well, that's not an only hope. That's a very strong hope. When Palkiwala argued that the basic structure of the constitution cannot be amended, there are a lot of people who said, what is this basic structure? He was putting forward a novel argument, novel at that time, but today it's widely accepted that basic structure cannot be amended. This is a similar novel idea. It's, it, it is there in Article 46. A constitution is a living document. Except this is a directive principle and it's not necessarily yeah, binding. But please understand, there's another article which says the state shall take every effort to give effect to the directive principles of, const of the constitution. And laws which are made to give effect to directive principles of the constitution have been held to be reasonable laws. Can I put it like this? This is an interpretation, possibly a gamble. It's not a no, certainty no, no. you can get away with it. Uh, listen, uh, I don't, I'm a lawyer. I don't think any argument is a gamble. An argument has to be formulated, reduced to a legal proposition, supported by precedent and other legal principles, and presented to a court. You don't call that a gamble. You call that the ability to put forward an argument in support of a case which you believe is a just cause. Except just a week ago, the R good Rajasthan High Court struck down Vasundhara Rajak Sindhya's attempts to extend reservations beyond 49% for the Gujars. That was an interim order. It's not a final judgment. Your attempt to do much the same in Andhra was struck down both by High Courts and Supreme Courts. I don't think we took resort to Article 46. That's the novelty, cases. which is why I say it's an interpretation and a gamble. Obviously, law is interpretation. Everything hinges on the Supreme Court I accepting reject the argument. argument. It's a gamble, and I think you should take back that word. That's not the way law functions. That's not the way arguments are presented it's in court. It's an innovation that you're trying. It is a living document. There is an article. Articles are interpreted from time to time. We are interpreting Article 46, and it's a very possible, plausible interpretation. How confident are you as a lawyer, not as a congressman, but as a lawyer, that you can pull this argument off? <laughs> Again, I reject these words, you pull this argument. Those are, you, th those are words which you should use in uh, a, a race course, uh, no, horse racing. Or uh, <laughs> Point is, there is Article 46. Mr. Sibyl has studied it at great uh, in great depth, he shared it with me, and I think it's a very plausible argument. One more 
question about Gujarat before I go to another subject. On Monday, Sonia Gandhi said, with great criticism of the government, that they were sabotaging parliament on flimbly grounds because the government hasn't so far announced the dates of the winter session. But the truth of the matter is that even your government from 2004, 2014, on several occasions, no, 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 delayed no several occasions. Tell, tell me the dates. I'll give you the dates. Tell in me 2007, the, the monsoon session. The dates was, came out in the paper today. I, can I can I give you the dates? All I'll but one. Dates. Just a moment. All but one case. In all but one case, if I remember right, the session started in November. On some date in November. That's the winter session. I'm talking about the monsoon session. We are talking about. Can the I can I give session. you the win the monsoon session dates mm -hmm. when on three consec not consecutive on three years, you were late in calling it. In 2007, the monsoon session, which is normally called in mid July, didn't happen till 10th of August. The reason given was the fact you were waiting for the Japanese prime minister to come to address the house. In 2008, the next year, after two days of meeting in July, 21st, 22nd July, Parliament didn't meet till October. And the explanation given was that the Prime Minister would be abroad for much of the in-between time. In 2011, again, the monsoon session, which should have been called in mid-July, didn't start till the 1st of August. And in <laughs> Indira Gandhi's time... July and August, July and August are not uh, the kind 14 of... 14 days, 15 days yeah, late. No, the point here is... What about 2008? You could have called the session, you could have called the session on the 15th of November and had a session for 7 days or 10 days what was the difficulty? Mrs. Gandhi, when Indira Gandhi was in power, as Ravi Shankar Prashad has made clear, once called the winter session after Christmas. Which year was this? I don't remember, but well, he's I gone on know. record. He's I gone on know. record. It's in the Hindu Today no, and the Times I don't of know. India. I'm, I and can't speak. And Chandrasekhar's government, which you supported, he says, did the same thing. Called the winter session after Christmas. Well, Chandrasekhar's government had, I think, by then, uh, Mr. Uh, whoever was there, we have decided to withdraw support. So Chandrasekhar's government has virtually uh, lamed that government. And they had to call a session, I think, to fulfill the six-month rule. We are talking about... No, the winter session of the Chandrasekhar government happened in December, and you were very much supporting it. You only pulled support in March the next year. So well, when the I winter session was delayed, you were fully behind him. You should ask Mr. Chandrasekhar's party, not me. But what about <laughs> Indira Gandhi? I don't even recall that. The point that. I'm making is that you're simply scoring I don't even recall that. No, All I'm, I'm saying is they had an opportunity to call the session. I'm simply saying this. When Sonia Gandhi accuses the government of sabotaging parliament because they've delayed calling the winter session, and there are so many instances where you delayed calling the monsoon session and no, no, Indra Gandhi not also. So many instances. I'm saying this You've is a case of pot calling the kettle black. You have got, given me exactly one Three. instance. 2007, one 2008, Please 2011. Understand. And Indra Gandhi before that. A delay of a few that. days, nobody is questioning a delay of a few days. You are talking about delay of a few days. Those are not... 2007 was from mid-July till 10th August. That's almost a month. That's what I'm trying to say. A monsoon session in July and August. July, it starts in July and ends in August. If it starts a few days late and ends a few days late, I don't think that's an issue. The point is, there was a clear opportunity to call this session in the first week of November or second week of November. If the elections in Gujarat, effectively the campaign starts sometime on the uh, 24th or something like that, isn't it? So you had a good 10, 15 days in November in which the session could have been called. If you wanted to break it into two sessions, that could have been done also. You could have called one part of the session and given a break and then reconvened again. The point is, why do you allow almost the whole of November to go without calling but a session? But is this sabotaging Parliament, Sonia's words? It's not sabotaging Parliament. You are, you are again... She called it that. You are not understanding the argument she is making. You don't want to call a session before the Gujarat election because you will be asked questions on a number of issues which have a bearing on the Gujarat election. So you want to avoid debate. You want to avoid questions which will have a bearing on the Gujarat election. If the Gujarat election and was that not... that is tantamount to sabotage. That is tantamount to hiding from the opposition, hiding from the opposition's questions, and trying to avoid answering those questions. If you are absolutely confident, you could have called a session for 10 days, had a debate on a few issues, and then adjourned the House. All right. Let's at this point switch from political issues and social issues to economic issues. There are two in particular that dominate the news, 
even though they're old, the impact they've had hasn't gone away. I'll start with demonetization and then I will come to GST. The government has identified three areas where they believe demonetization has brought substantial gains. As a former finance minister, I want to take you through each of them one by one. First of all, the finance minister says that all the unaccounted money has now been banked. After the government has identified what portion is black, it will be taxed, possibly penalized, and there will be substantive gains to the exchequer. Separately, Surjit Bhalla, now a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, has gone on record to say that in the first year alone, the gain could be 2.5 lakh crore, mm. and subsequently, the gain will be 1.5 lakh every year in perpetuity. Do you buy that, or pipe do you think dreams. that's exaggerated? These are all pipe dreams. This was not the stated objective of the government. The government's stated objective was one, when the Attorney General told the Supreme Court, three to four lakh crore will not come back to the Reserve Bank four of India. Four to five, actually. Well, whatever. <laughs> it's a huge amount. And that is a gain to the government. When that went up in smoke, they've come up with this completely opposite argument. Well, everything has come back and that's a gain. If four to five lakhs did not come, that would be a gain. If everything came back, that would be a gain. I mean, who are they making a fool of? But do you the believe point they is, can identify it as the, black and tax it? As I've said repeatedly, until the process of adjudication, appeal, a second appeal is completed, the money that has been exchanged in the bank and sitting in a bank account is legitimate white money. The money has been exchanged until it is proved to be unaccounted money liable to tax the money's legitimate money of the account holder. So this will take years if oh, they succeed? Oh, this will, of course, because the capacity of the income tax department, we know, they do not have the capacity to process the one lakh notices that they threaten to send out. And if they send out anything more than one lakh, I will conclude that they are fooling the people. So this is why you call this a pipe dream. Absolutely. And where will what is this Surjit Mr. Surjit Balla's calculation of 2.5 lakh crore a year and 1.5 lakh crore in perpetuity? Where, where do you get these numbers from? In other words, you're suggesting he's virtually cooked them up. I'm not saying he's cooked them up. <laughs> he's a reputed economist. I just happen to disagree with him, that's all. The second big gain the government says is to do with the cash to GDP ratio. The finance minister has gone on record to say that the cash to GDP ratio has fallen from 11.3 to 9.7 percent. Separately, in an essay he put on his blog, he said that the reduction of currency in circulation is of the order of 3.89 lakh crore. So? And the business standard has said, in one of their leaders, that digital transactions have increased year on year by 41 percent. Which textbook says a lower cash to GDP ratio is good and a higher cash to GDP ratio is bad. So the government's assumption itself is fallacious. Which textbook says that? Which economist has said it? How much cash there should be in an economy to keep the wheels of an economy moving is what we call money supply. And that is a matter that should be determined by the Reserve Bank of India. The government has no business saying what shall be the level of money supply. So in claiming that the fall in cash to GDP ratio, there's been a gain, the government is wrong because their assumption is fallacious to start but with. It's one of the reasons why demand is lower. Because the cash to GDP ratio is perhaps not sufficient to sustain a 7-8% growth. So far from this being a gain, this could be one reason why demand it is, is falling. It is one of the reasons. Of that I'm clear. How much impact it has, I can't say. It is one of the reasons that maybe the cash in circulation is not enough to sustain high growth. So on both these counts, which the government claims as gains, you're saying one is a pipe dream and the other could actually be one of the reasons why economic activity has slowed down. In any way, the assumption the government is basing its argument on itself is unproven yeah. and wrong. Yeah. Let's come to the third big gain the finance minister talks about. Once again, in the essay he put up on his blog, he said that the number of individual income taxpayers had gone up by 56 lakh since demonetization. He said the year before, they had only gone up by 22 lakh. So this, he was claiming, was an increase of over 150%. And separately, the Indian Express has said that if you include people who filed returns but didn't pay tax, as well as those who paid tax but didn't file returns, the increase is not 56 lakh, it's 1.26 crore. Yeah. 
we we'll wait for the end of the year number of how many people have come on to the tax base. We have had different numbers by different people. Revenue Secretary gave a number, CEA gave a number, Finance Minister gives a number. Let's see at the end of the year how many people have filed their returns. But if the number of people who file, what we call filers, has increased, I'm happy. But please remember what the CEA said. The average income disclosed by these new filers is 2.7 lakhs, which is barely above the threshold but exemption can limit. I, can I give you an answer threshold, to that? Just a moment. Barely above the threshold exemption limit. And obviously, the revenue gains are not going to be commensurate. There's no doubt that this year, although the numbers filing returns has increased, the actual amount of money they've paid is not very much. Why are they but talking once, about... But once they're why on the book the as income tax payers and the economy picks up, these people will be paying more and more. So in future years, the amount will go up hugely. Will, with all these great numbers... Why is the government sending out signals it will not meet its revenue target? That itself contradicts the claim that this is again. Number one. Number two, there is a phenomenon in Indian uh, tax compliance called stop filers. People who file returns to stop filing after a year or two. And then we have to chase them all over so again. So this could be a one-off? Well, that's why I said... These are not matters where you can come to instant conclusions in a matter of three to four months. We will have to wait to see at the end of the year how many returns have been filed. We will have also have to wait to see for a year or two how many of them continue to file. So once again, what the government claims is a gain. These are all premature claims. Is a premature claim. And it may turn out not to be a gain at well, all. Well, I'm not wishing it turns out to be but wrong. But that could be the case. But that is the reality. To conclude this particular part, Arun Jaitley in that essay put up on his blog said that this was a watershed moment in the history of the Indian economy and then he added <coughs> that it had ended once and for all what he called the chalta hai traditional attitude towards corruption which had prevailed in your government's time. <laughs> what chalta hai? Go to any government office, try to get a caste certificate, try to get your building plan approved, try to get your patta or Sat bara, uh, change made. The chalta attitude is there in every government office. It's, it's a normal there, and I don't defend the normal, that's a fact. The normal is, if you want to get your work done, you have to pay money. And that is still is the Mr. situation. Is Mr. Arun Jaitley saying that all that is vanished now? He's living in a uh, dream world if he thinks all that is vanished. It's there. You just go to any office. Nothing, come with has, me, come with nothing me. has changed as far as Greece money concerns go. That has become the normal in India and I resent it. I'm unhappy about it. But you have to acknowledge that fact. That has become the normal. Now, as far as corruption in high places is concerned, as I said, when a government is in office, all you hear is insinuations, some suspicion, some doubts. It's difficult to get all the facts of a case that will show up a clear case of corruption. You mean when the government goes out of office, then it's you'll find out about corruption all, in high places? All, uh, it's only when a government's term comes to an end, these things come to surface. In other words, what you're saying is the claim the BJP made that there's been no corruption at the upper levels. And they say that it, in contrast, there was to, none TG, in UPA in one, contrast for to Colgate, they are clean at the top. You're yeah. saying we'll find out when the government goes and the books are open. No, there's, there's, there's this Rafael case. And we've asked a question for which we're waiting for an answer for the last but three why days. Did the, you brought up the Rafael case. Why do you believe that in fact there is some mystery suggesting corruption? I'll tell you why. Price? Because the plane they are buying comes priced with all the equipment, weaponry and electronics, the plane you were pricing was minus all of that. The uh, addition makes the difference. All that we asked was, the, in that press conference, all that the defense minister was asked was, is it correct that the price of the plane contracted by the UPA government was about 526 crore a plane, and the plane that you have contracted 
is over 1,200 crore. 1,500. 500 crore. To which she turned and said, uh, the Defence Secretary or the Defence uh, Production Secretary, will you please give the numbers? Now, this was four days ago. The numbers have not been given yet. Why? If you know... You mean the delay is suspicious? No, the delay raises further questions. Why can't you give the number? But can I... Can if I, you've got a, such a complete answer, complete explanation, give the number out. I can't answer why the Defence Secretary hasn't given the number and why there's been a four-day delay. But I can point one thing out to you, which is a point made by many strategic editors, Ajay Shukla in particular, that the plane that you were pricing at roughly 500 crore was minus electronics equipment and all the high-flown equ equipment and technology that the Air Force has insisted on. Wait a the plane, the NDA's pricing is with all that equipment, including the Israeli headgear, and that's why there's a difference in price. So You're let, not comparing let the government like say to it, like. Let the government say it. Let the government give the breakup of the price of the plane, and let them also say from the UPA's uh, contract, if we were buying only a shell and all this was to be an add-on, I'm sure they must have priced that before they decided to sign a contract to manufacture it in HAL, isn't it? They must have priced it. So let's release those, release those documents as well as your documents. So let's compare the prices of the two planes. Can I put this to you? You're s raising a question, and I presume the Congress party at the back of its mind, even if it hasn't expressed this openly, suspects that there is something murky, something suspicious, something corrupt. Is that what no, no. you're trying to get We haven't said at? anything like that. Do you think All someone's made money? We haven't said anything like that. Don't put words in my mouth. We haven't Sujewala said anything like that. today actually uses the word murky in his Indian Express article. Who says? Randeep Singh Surjewala. All that he we uses are saying the word is, murky. All that we are saying is, here is a contract for a X number of planes. Some will be bought, most will be made. You have got a contract for only 36 aircraft at this price. Now, obviously, both can't be right. Both can't be correct judgments. One judgment. Nobody's question at the moment is talking anything about motive. If one judgment is right, the other judgment is wrong. So let's have the facts and the documents relating to the two decisions taken by the two governments. Many people fear that when Congress raised the Rafad issue suddenly, <coughs> they did it because this was your way before the Gujarat elections of casting mud on the government and getting even for the fact that they are always alleging that you're corrupt because of 2G and Colgate. What mud are we? We are asking questions. You have the answers. Share the answers. If asking questions is throwing mud, These that's a new These are innocent questions being asked out of curiosity, not an intention to try and throw mud. Is sure it not, are these not uh, straightforward questions? I think they are quite straightforward Politicians questions. Politicians rarely do anything straightforward. Well, I, I think, uh, I think uh, the boot is on the other leg. I think journalists rarely ask straightforward <laughs> questions. Let's come back to economic issues. We've discussed demonetization. We wandered off into Rafal. But let's now come back to GST. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt that GST raised multiple concerns about the number of rates about the way items fit into those rates, about the complicated procedures that small businesses and even big businesses have to go through, and then the efficiency and functioning of the GST network. But it's also true that the government has made repeated strenuous attempts to put these right. Thanks so to my, Gujarat. So my first question is, today, four and a half months after its launch, how do you view GST why are you, after the amendments and changes? Why is the government, why did the government scramble the eggs in a particular way and trying to unscramble scrambled eggs. We could have made a proper omelette or a proper sunny side up, isn't it? You made a mess of it. Thanks to Gujarat elections, you're forced to retrace your steps, which is why I say this is not GST. What you introduced was not GST. What you introduced is your own version of a Tax. But let me put this to you. After all the amendments and changes in rules, regulations, as well as changing the level of taxation of many items, what are now the key problems? Oh, that there's still, still have many, to be many resolved? issues. What are the main ones? The main one is it's still not a single rate. And the government is unwilling to say, after a period of transition, which I accept, it will be a single rate. GST the world over is a single rate. Except that the CEA talking to the Economic Times on Tuesday 
did suggest that it could become three rates in due course. It was always the single rate always meant an R and R a revenue neutral rate, uh, R and R minus and an R and R plus. When we said single rate, read the CEA's report, which he gave two and a half, two years ago. Uh, single rate meant, single rate was a shorthand way of saying R and R, R and R minus and an R and R plus. And that that's, is, that's the first problem that has to be put right. You believe that you need is a single the GST. Rate. That is the GST. What you have is not GST. You can call it by whatever name you want to call. GST is eventually, it will be a single rate. But we acknowledge that because of the largeness of the country and the nature of trade and business in this country, nature of consumption, we must have an R and R minus and an R and R plus. So that's one. But as I said, in my speech in parliament, 70% of the goods and services or more should be at that r, &R rate. This is therefore one issue they still need First to tackle. Issue. Although I'll point out for the sake of the audience that in the interview he gave the Economic Times on Tuesday, the CA has indicated they're moving in that direction. Well, why what do you have to move in the direction? We could have started at that point. What are the other issues that need to be tackled? The other issue is there is today a diarchy of control. Some Vendors, some service providers are controlled by the state government, some are controlled by the central government, and I think they've got some kind of a division, uh, 90, 10, and uh, 10, 90. And all this is utter confusion. If you and I are in the same city doing the same business, why should your controlling authority, in your case, should be central government, and why should be the controlling authority in my case? It all depends government. upon the value of the transaction. There is a diarchy in control which is going to lead to utter confusion. So that's later. the second thing that must well, be corrected. That is a major, major. The third is, they still don't seem to believe that GST is a non-cascading tax. An input credit must be given in every case. They have denied input credit. Only recently, after they reduced the GST rate for restaurants, from um, I 18 think uh, to 18 five. to 5, they've denied them GST input credit. Now, what kind of uh, GST are you designing? The basis of GST is uh, input credit will be allowed and it's a non-cascading tax. If you deny input credit, it becomes a cascading tax. Which is why restaurants haven't reduced their prices. Well, why they have not reduced the prices may be due to many reasons. But they've said so. Food inputs, by, for input prices may have gone up. No, no, they said specifically it's because they're not getting input credit. Yeah, but what about the matching invoice issue? Is that another key issue for you? Well, I don't know the uh, mechanics of all that, but I'm sure lots of traders have told me that complying with the current rules is almost impossible, which is why when a bunch of um, chartered accountants and lawyers and traders uh, went to uh, Ahmedabad, uh, when I was there two weeks ago, and challenged the, uh, that uh, Kendra, that uh, there was a, they set up a Kendra to help uh, filers, and asked those officials, you fill out this GST form. Not one official was able to fill the form after two hours of uh, trying to do so. So to sum up your position on GST, first of all, what they've created is not GST. Yes. Secondly, it's extremely confusing. Yes. Thirdly, by not giving input credit, yes. they're actually making it cascading rather and there's than another the problem. opposite. Today, you have to pay and then apply for refund. It so should be the other way around. No, the earlier exercise was when you pay, you take credit for what you have paid. This is where the matching invoice problem this comes in. This is where, while imitating the excise pattern, they have distorted the excise pattern. You have to pay first and then claim a refund. And the refund may come three months later. Refund may not come. Refund may end in a dispute. Whereas the correct approach is, if you are taking input credit, when you pay, you must take the credit and pay only the balance. Okay, Mr. Thumbram, let's leave it there. A pleasure okay. talking to you. Thank you. you.